Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this evening for the first event of our events programme for the exhibition Reflections, the Light and Life of John Henry Lorimer. I am Charlotte Lorimer, so I am the great, great niece of John Henry, and I'm the co-curator of the exhibition. And this evening, I'm going to be running through a number of paintings and the family tree and a family photograph to talk about some of the people who are within the paintings. And um, some of it isn't so certain. So some of them I'm guessing from the research that I've done, uh, but I will explain all of that as we come to it. The first painting is probably the one that most of you will know best, especially if you're Edinburgh locals and um, friends of the City Art Centre or visitors of the City Art Centre. So this painting is part of their permanent collection. It's called The Flight of the Swallows. And it's really the spark for the whole exhibition because it was the popularity of this painting from the visitors of the City Art Centre that then led um, David, who's my co-curator, and his team to approach the Lorimer Society, for which I'm the curator, and um, talk about why there had never been an exhibition of John Henry's work. And so it was through this painting that then they started talking and then I came in um, about four years ago and started working on the exhibition. Um, and this is one of my favorite paintings as I'm sure many people will share that view. Um, the person that we think it could be in the painting, which was told to me by my, um, my dad's cousin, Monica, who grew up at Kelly, is Alice. So this was John Henry's younger sister and she moved to Guyana, um, which was called British Guyana at the time, when she was 21. And she had six children with Sir David Chalmers. And each, a couple of summers, they came back to Kelly. And so the thinking is that the swallows are symbolic of the end of the summer, because that's when they would fly away. And that would also be symbolic of their time at Kelly, which would explain the kind of sorrow and melancholiness of this painting. So if it was Alice, it may have been that she modelled for it, but I, we haven't got any sources for that. Um, it also may have been that it was just a scene that John Henry saw and then remembered and captured later on. Judging by the, the date of the painting, which is around 1905, the children could be um, Nan or Hannah, the eldest, sort of with her hand on Alice's waist, um, Elsie, who's called Alison or Elsie, um, crying at the window. And then um, I think James, who was called Giacco, um, that was his nickname. All of the Florima children in lots of generations had lots of nicknames. Um, and so that's who I think it could be, but um, not entirely sure. And, and that's sort of the interpretation that has been passed down and that I've tried to find a little bit more evidence for. Um, and a lot of that evidence has come from the archive, which um, Esther Chalmers, who was Alice's sixth child, put together. And Esther is, I think, the little girl who is in the foreground of this, paint, this photograph. So she's wearing um, all of her finery and looking very sweet on Alice's knee. Um, next to her, I think, is um, John Henry and their mother, um, who is also called Hannah. Um, and then in the back, we've got standing up. So Robert Lorimer, who is my great grandfather, um, he is on the far left. Um, John Henry is the man with the bow tie. Um, and we know those two for sure because there's another photograph which actually labels them. But everybody else, I'm slightly just trying to piece it together. Um, the woman in the in the middle standing up with the black hat could be Hannah, another sister, or Louise, another sister. And then all of the children are Alice's. So I think we've got Patrick, who's the eldest, standing up. Um, and then we've got Thomas Michael Chalmers with the bota. Um, on the other side in the little outfit, we've got James or Giacco, and then either Nan or Elsie next to him, and then Esther. And the dog was called Burley. And so these are some of the family members who are represented in the paintings. Um, very much like Alice is sort of the inspiration for quite a number, or I think she is. Um, Hannah or Louise also modelled for a number of different paintings, which I will come to later on. This is the family tree that I've put together, which has lots of paintings by John Henry of these various different family members. Um, the first is of Hannah, who was his mother. So she was born Hannah Stoddart, and she was the great granddaughter of Robert Stoddart, who was very well known in his day. Um, he actually trained as an engineer and then he went to Tobago. 
And, and it said that not only was he very ill, but he had a visceral hatred of slavery and did not last very long on that island and came home pretty quickly. Um, so from being an engineer, he then ended up doing an apprenticeship in London with a piano maker and then ended up setting up his own piano firm and um, patented the first upright piano. So that is the history of, of her family and music was very important to her. Um, there are lots of wonderful references to her playing the Moonlight Sonata um, in the evening and music was something that was very important to the family um, and a huge part of their lives. She also studied um, geology and theology at Edinburgh University uh, when all of her children were growing up and she took art lessons. So she um, painted alongside her son, John Henry, sometimes, um, all kind of encouraged him to keep going with a sketch um, or, or just sort of in general, huge, huge encouragement all the way throughout his life came from his mother. James Lorimer, um, Professor James, he was the Professor of Public Law at the University of Edinburgh. And he was appointed there, let me just check my notes, in 1845. Um, and he remained in post until the end of his life. Um, he, as you can see from those dates, he was considerably older than Hannah. Um, and they met each other on the boat from Leith to Largo, um, when there was such a thing. And she was very seasick, um, and so was her brother. And he took her in um, and made sure that she was okay. And little did he know that four years later, she would become his wife and then go on to become the mother of his six children. And there is a beautiful um, description of this meeting, which I've included in the audio guide, uh, which I can link at the end if anybody is interested. It's about an hour long and it corresponds to the exhibition designed to guide you around as you go. And it has dramatized um, letters and memoirs. And this is one of them. This was um, performed by Clive Russell which was um, a real honour. So I was really happy to have included that. And he brought it to life, which was lovely. Um, so Professor James ended up, um, the other thing that's interesting about him is that he founded, co-founded the Institute of International Law in 1873. Um, and that went on to gain a Nobel Peace Prize in 1904. And I think the reason for that was because it had a particular focus on human rights law. Um, and that was a sort of huge, huge part of what he did. He, he was very forward thinking. He supported the enfranchisement of women. So he was a supporter of folks for women. Um, and that was sort of, they walked their talk in that way because Hannah um, was educated at the university as well. Um, and so were their three daughters. And this is obviously a mark of the huge privilege of the family in that they had a father who was a professor, but also I think the value that they placed on education. Um, and this sort of the way that they treated their sons and daughters, from what I can understand, it was that they encouraged them all to pursue what they wanted to pursue, which is great. Um, the other thing to say about James and Hannah is that they are key in the restoration of Kelly Castle, um, which is fundamental to everything that John Henry Lorimer is about, really. Um, and if you haven't been, I would really encourage it. It's a really very special place. Um, it's in the East Nuke of Fife, and the story goes that the family were having a picnic um, and walking through from where they were staying in Pittenween, or one of the nearby fishing villages. Um, the reason that they stayed there is because James had asthma, and so he needed to ease his asthma each summer. And so from that picnic, they stumbled upon it. John Henry was about 21 years old at this time, and they completely fell in love with it. And then a year or so later, they looked into leasing it and they secured that lease for 38 years. And it was supposed to be wind and water tight. I'm not sure whether it was either when they took it on, um, but it was by the time that they had finished restoring it and they, they had their first. So they began the restoration in April of 1878. And then they had their first night there in the September. So um, it didn't take them too long to actually have that kind of first evening all together. And I love the idea of them all piling in and um, having a night together in the castle of, and it was the first of many. They, they looked after it for a very long time. It passed down the generations um, and then it passed to the National Trust in 1970. So what else can I say about the parents? I think 
they really, as I've already said, they valued education, but they also deeply valued the arts. And I think what's interesting is that they let both John Henry and Robert leave the University of Edinburgh early um, without finishing their degrees so that they could pursue painting for John Henry and architecture for Robert. Um, so going on to the children, we've got James, who's the eldest. Uh, he was the least creative, um, as far as I know, of the six children, um, but said to be a very kind and compassionate person. And he was a, uh, an apprentice to a merchant in Leith and then took that trade and wanted to find his fortune abroad. So he sailed and left Kelly, um, but sadly died of typhoid fever in South Africa. So he died when he was fairly young. Um, and didn't play a huge role from when he left. The letters are still there, but um, he, he doesn't feature in any of the paintings um, that I know of, which is why there's a photograph of him rather than a painting by John Henry. All of the others are, are portraits from, from John Henry. Next is Hannah, um, and she was an all-round artist. She carved bookcases, she painted, she did watercolors. She was a superb sculptress. Um, and really undervalued, I think. She never became a professional artist in the same way that her brothers did, uh, but some of her uh, sketches of orchids are preserved at Kew Gardens, and uh, wonderfully we've got one of those which is in the exhibition, uh, and she did those while she was living in Guyana with her husband, who was an explorer and botanist uh, called Sir Everard Imthern. So that's Hannah. Um, she was really important to John Henry. She, I think from what I understand of the letters, she was the closest to him. And they, they bounced ideas around each other, gave each other encouragement as and when they needed it. And he was very excited to tell her when there was something that had gone wonderfully well and also confided his anxieties in her when a portrait wasn't going his way or he was doubting himself, of which he did quite a lot. Um, not that you would know it from the technical brilliance of lots of his paintings. So then we have John Henry, uh, who is the centre of this exhibition. And at the beginning, when we were talking about how this exhibition would look, we thought about whether it should be the Lorimer family and these, particularly these six children as a whole, or whether it should focus on him. And I felt strongly that because he hadn't ever had an exhibition dedicated to his life and work, that should be the focus and then inevitably the family would become part of it because they were his inspiration and his support and so we actually have a piece by Hannah in the exhibition and several pieces by Robert we've got a sketch from his first um, commission which was to restore Earl's Hall which is in Fife um, which is a castle and we also have some of the furniture that he designed and possibly a chair that Hannah carved although I can't be sure of that so that would be the chair that is featured in the portrait of Professor James. Next, we have Alice, who I've already spoken about. She had six children herself. Um, when she was staying in Guyana, she set up a reformatory for young girls and sent her daughters off to read to them each week. She also set up a shoe shop because apparently the shoes were quite hard to come by for children, um, children's shoe shop in Guyana. And then she fundraised for local housing. So those are the three details that I've managed to find out about her life in Guyana. Uh, and then when she returned to Edinburgh in 1895, she became the secretary to the Brunsfield Women's Hospital, which was near where the family lived in Brunsfield Crescent. And she raised her children, I guess. Um, although I don't think she was particularly present and the woman who really raised them and spent the most time with them was Joanna Herbert, who I will come to later on. She features prominently in the paintings and um, she's someone who I've absolutely loved finding out more about. Louise is next and Louise was the writer of the family. She, again, never became a professional writer in a sense, but she was paid, as far as I know, for certain pieces. And she did descriptive pieces of Poland where she traveled in the 1890s and met Mark Twain along, her, along the way uh, when they were in Vienna. She was with uh, a novelist called Dorothea and somehow they ended up having tea with Mark Twain. I'd love to know more, but it's a, a little fleeting glimpse that was mentioned in Esther Chalmers' um, work, who was the baby that we saw um, in the previous photograph whose archive has been such a huge resource for all of the things that I found out about the paintings and the family. Um, 
So Louise never married, similar to John Henry, um, and she remained in Scotland for most of her life uh, when she wasn't traveling. And she also wrote about the history of Scotland um, and seems in general just quite a force of nature. She um, is one that my aunts and uncles remember and talk very fondly of. And then finally, we have Robert. Um, and many of you, or some of you may have heard of him. He was very famous in his lifetime. He designed um, around 50 houses. He restored all sorts of properties all over the UK. He also did work in France and Finland. And he's most famous for the Thistle Chapel, which is at the back of St. Giles Cathedral, which is the huge cathedral on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh. <coughs> he also um, uh, designed and pulled together the Scottish National War Memorial, which is part of Edinburgh Castle. And that was really the, the pinnacle of his career. It was an incredible uh, project which involved more than 200 craftsmen. And he described himself as the sort of conductor of an orchestra. Uh, and that reference, that musical reference is makes perfect sense. He was also a huge lover of music, uh, like his mother. And so that was the way that he talked or thought about his work. Um, and unlike John Henry, he has been remembered in a way that the painter hasn't. Um, I don't quite understand why that is. Maybe it's just the narrative around painting and the narrative around architecture. Um, my suspicion on John Henry is that because his paintings are so traditional and you can see them here, um, especially the ones of Hannah and Alice, that's actually the same painting, it's called Conversation Piece. And that is almost sort of Dutch quality. You wouldn't ever know that that was done in the time that it was done in the late 1890s. And, and I think that there's a tendency in art history to look at the rebels of the movements or the people who pushed art forward in a way or broke the rules and changed the game. And John Henry was not a rebel. He did not break the rules. He didn't change the way that art was thought of or looked at. Uh, but what he did do was capture the people around him with huge sensitivity in my view and accuracy. And hopefully it has a timeless quality to his paintings that people can now look back on and, and really appreciate. And we can look at those artists that have been popular at their time, successful at their time, in their time, but then don't fit that narrative of art history. Um, and it's funny to think that he was a contemporary of, he was alive at the same time as Picasso. He was a contemporary of, Monet and the Impressionists, and they were the ones who were breaking the rules and trying different things and then setting up their own exhibitions when they were rejected from the Salon in Paris. And at the same time, John Henry was that painter who was being accepted at the Salon and then having paintings that were given medals. And so he's at the other end of that narrative. And so I'm really pleased that we've been able to shed some light on his work and, and hopefully more people can see it and and gain an understanding and, and hopefully enjoy looking at it. So just um, one more family portrait, which wasn't included in the family tree there. This is of Robert. And the reason that I've included it is that I just think it shows a little bit of the bond that they had as brothers um, in that when he died, Robert Lorimer died in 1929, he had appendicitis and had a routine operation that didn't go right. Uh, so it was a huge shock to the family and everybody. And when this happened, he displayed, John Henry decided to display this painting in London. And there it was bought by the Chantry Fund, and then it passed to the Tate after that. So this painting was done when John Henry was only 20 years old, and Robert was 12. And I don't think they always had the easiest of relationships, especially not in later life. But as young boys, I think that he was somebody that Ron, um, John Henry loved to sketch and paint. Um, he was fascinated by the restoration of Kelly, which began when he was 14. I'm talking about Robert here. So John Henry was older. And there are sort of lovely things where they, he seemed to, John Henry seemed to help him out with the Scottish National War Memorial and um, just give him ideas and they could discuss things together. Um, a very funny complaint though, that Robert had of um, John Henry's paintings was that they were too large. And when we were putting up some of the paintings in the gallery, I had to say I knew where he was coming from. <laughs> um, and 
the the reason that he thought they were too large and that was an issue is that John Henry wanted Robert to sort of upsell some of his paintings to some of his many wealthy um, commissions of, of for architecture and for rest, restoring these houses. Uh, so that wasn't such a collaborative relationship as I understand. But um, in general, I think they were able to see eye to eye as artists and um, they traveled together. They went to Chartres Cathedral and, and had lovely, wonderful memories from that time. The next painting is also a portrait. Um, this is of Freddie Guthrie Tate, who was an amateur golfer and lieutenant. He was a part of the Black Watch and he died in 1900 uh, during the Boer War. And after this happened, the members of the Royal and Ancient Golf Club uh, in St Andrews pulled together and commissioned this portrait of him, which was created from photographs rather than from um, life, obviously. And Freddie Guthrie Tate is a really wonderful character that again I've had so much fun finding out about him um, John Lowe who was a contemporary of his wrote what is believed to be the first biography um, of a golfer and it's full of all sorts of wonderful stories um, one of which is that when John Henry sorry when uh, Freddie Guthrie Tate was a young boy probably about four he'd seen the gardener planting things like potatoes and then more potatoes would come out for the ground and his older brother noticed that some of his golf balls were going missing. And so nobody could understand where they were going. And eventually they found that Freddie Tate was taking them and planting them in the garden in the hope that they would then become multiply and there would be more golf balls. Um, so he had a, a keen interest in golf for a very young age. He started playing when he was about five and he won around 28 tournaments in the, I think, nine years he was playing. So he was incredibly successful. He came third at two Open Championships. This is when amateurs and professionals could play alongside each other. And uh, if you're wondering about the caddy, um, and especially if any of you have been to the exhibition already, uh, he has a kind of strange expression on his face. And the story that my dad always told me was that he was blind, this caddy. And sadly, I haven't found any written reference to him other than um, the use of the word hirplin, which I think is a Scottish word for someone who walks with a limp, but it could possibly be broader. Um, if anybody knows that, do tell me, because I'm really interested to know. Uh, but that I think would explain that strange look in his eyes. Um, and there is a reference to the wee hirplin caddy in John Lowe's biography. So I'm guessing that that is the caddy, but sadly I don't have a name for him either. Um, I do have the name for the dog though, who was called Nails. And uh, I love that John Henry very often included animals in his paintings, um, very skillfully depicted. So the next portrait is of Dame Sarah Elizabeth Siddons Mayer. And she was a suffragist and feminist campaigner, um, especially for women's education in Edinburgh and Scotland more broadly. She was the great granddaughter of Sarah Mare, who was the actress, and you can see Sarah Mare in the painting that's behind him, behind her. So there's sort of painting within a painting. Um, you might also notice that there are chess pieces, uh, and that is because she was the president of the Ladies Chess Club. And behind her, there are um, bow and arrow or arrows, and that's a reference to the fact that she was the president of the Ladies Archery Club. But arguably, most importantly, she was the president of the Ladies Debating Society, which she set up when she was 19 years old and she remained president until she died, age 90. So a huge reign supreme on what became an incredibly lively and very important society because it, I think it's really a confidence builder for lots of those women and it's a huge place for networking. Um, and, and from that, it was this domino effect, more people, more women came through and they then set up their own initiatives and schools. Um, one of which was Louisa Lumsden who set up and founded uh, St. Leonard's School. The social reformer Flora Stevenson was also part of that. And we have some events coming up which focus on these women and on Sarah Mayer um, in particular, which I think will be really interesting. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about those women who are connected to um, Sarah Elizabeth Siddons Mayer. Um, and this was a painting that he did in 1928. It was later on. And part of the reason I wanted to include it is really for that context of the way that he painted women, how he felt about their position in 
life as a as part of an Edwardian and Victorian society. And when I saw that he had been commissioned to do a suffragist, I thought it was just a fascinating detail, um, but never thought that I would find the portrait. I had the name of her and I had that he did a portrait and possibly a date. And then I went looking online and I found that there was a plaque to her at St George's School in Edinburgh. And so I sent an email to the receptionist, just complete shot in the dark. And I said, I'm doing this exhibition. I would love to find this portrait, but I've got nowhere to start. Um, have you got any idea if she had any family? What's the history of the plaque? Anything you can tell me would be wonderful. And the receptionist, who just happened to be an ex-pupil of St George's School, wrote back to me very quickly with um, the details of a brochure which had a huge amount of information about um, Sally Mare was her name, her nickname, um, and also a black and white photograph of this portrait. And when she saw the black and white photograph, because she was an ex-pupil, she said, oh, I know exactly where that is. It's on that stair above all of these the people. You know, we walk past it all the time. And so finding that painting was such a thrill. And I'm so pleased that it's been included in the exhibition um, because she was, she was such, a, such an extraordinary person. And I just think it's important for more people to know, know about the lives of these people that John Henry was privileged enough to paint. He did around... 100 portraits during his lifetime and it was his bread and butter money. Um, he didn't particularly enjoy doing portraits, but I feel he was very good at them. And they informed the genre paintings that he did. Um, so genre is the term for the domestic and family life scenes often imagined, but sometimes sparked from a real event. Um, and this would be one example. So this is the 11th hour. Um, and the black and white image that you can see behind it just shows how much this painting has been cut down. So this was sold to, um, it was bought by the Pennsylvania Gallery um, when it had, was on display in Paris in 1900, it won a gold medal. And then after that, it cast across the Atlantic and then I think passed to the Kennedy Gallery in New York. And then from there went into private ownership and then private ownership again. And at some point, one of those private owners um, must have cut it down, probably because it was so large. Um, so you can see how much has been left and chopped away, um, which I think is, is incredibly sad, especially because the huge part of the story is the abandoned bouquet of flowers, which you can see in the corner. Um, so there's just a tiny little corner of the ribbon that you can still see, but most of it is gone. And that obviously adds to the narrative of this weeping bride. So the question is, who is this weeping bride? There are a couple of possible people, um, one of which is Alice, who married when she was 21 and therefore would have left her family and left Scotland and left Kelly. And so the title could refer to her final hour at Kelly rather than her final hour before marriage. Um, and the reason that I think that that was suggested to me by a family friend um, it's because she was very happily married from what I can understand. Um, I don't think that her marriage would have been a sad occasion. She and her husband fell in love with each other, were engaged very quickly, and then she set off on this adventure across the Atlantic. So that would be my interpretation of that. What weakens that suggestion is that it, when it was displayed in Paris, it was called um, mariage de convenance, which means marriage of convenience. So that to me suggests something that is more arranged and less happy. Um, and it could be that this was somebody that John Henry loved and had to let go. And so again, there are very few written sources that I've been able to find, but I have found a letter that refers to um, a woman called Jenny and her family seemed to have prevented them from marrying each other or pursuing a relationship together. I think because it, he was a young artist with, um, unstable prospects, shall we say. So her, her family weren't too keen on the idea of that. And so I think that they separated them and sent her away to Newcastle. Um, so that's one possibility. The other possibility, and I'm just gonna move on quickly because I'm aware of time and I want to leave quite time for questions, um, is that it could be Isabel Baxter. Um, so she was painted by John Henry. She was actually, this was commissioned by her fiance um, and later husband and he is, it's, it's been said in the family that he, uh, John Henry was in love with her. Um, he was 22 when he painted her. Um, she was 29 at the time. And so this is another possibility. Again, I'm guessing here, it's just trying to make connections. It's very loose, um, but it's a possibility. 
Um, other things about Isabel Baxter. Yeah, I think she, so she was born in 1850. Um, she died in 1943, so she lived a very long life. Um, and she was married to Edward Baxter. Um, and this is a family portrait that's passed down my family. Um, and we have included, it's the only oval portrait as well that we've got. I think that was quite unusual. I'm not quite sure why he decided to do that, but something that was very um, typical of John Henry is that he often had something red um, in his portraits. You'll notice that in the early one of Robert when he was young. So the red rose and it sort of sets off the pinkness of her cheeks and her lips. Now we're coming to what would be the final room in the exhibition. Uh, so this is called A Peaceful Art, and this shows his mother reading at the window, um, Hannah, and then his sister, elder sister, Laurie, who's embroidering the big bedspread or tapestry. It's difficult to see what it is um, in the front. And then by the window further back is Louise, and she's um, embroidering there. And in the exhibition, we've got uh, a bedspread which has the Lorimer family motto, which is upward onward. And that was done by, that was stitched by Louise and the local postwoman who was called Jean Skinner and was designed by Robert Lorimer. So it's lovely to have something that Louise worked on as well to bring in that creative side. Um, this is a private collection painting and I'm very grateful to all of the private lenders. Um, it's wonderful to see so many paintings that otherwise nobody would see unless you knew the, the owner. So some of them haven't been on public display for 30 years. Um, including, this one is, is on public display sometimes, but the last one, Grandmother's Birthday, hasn't been on display for 30 years. Um, this is my grandfather, is the baby, um, Christopher Lorimer, and my great-grandmother, Violet Wilde, who married Robert Lorimer. And this is set at Kelly Castle. Like the Peaceful Art, the Peaceful Art is set in the Northwest Tower. Um, and this is over in the Southeast Tower. And you can see the Bass Rock um, through the open window there, um, which is a very distinctive East Nuke of Fife view. And this is my favorite painting um, in the exhibition, even more so than Grandmother's Birthday, which I will show you next. And the reason being not only the kind of personal family connect connection there, but just the way that he's used that light and that space around the people. I think it's such a beautifully simple um, construction, but so well executed and has such an atmosphere to it. It just feels very soothing and calming. Um, and I really am so happy to have that one in the exhibition. This is one that I had only ever seen photographs of and hadn't ever actually stood in front of like many of the paintings. So when they were being installed, I was just so excited to go into the gallery whenever I was and see yet more paintings that I feel like I know very intimately, but hadn't actually been in the presence of. Um, the other things to say about this painting is that we are lucky enough to have the cradle that was designed for Christopher by Robert and is usually housed at Kelly Castle. Uh, so that is a lovely connection to make. And then we also have the letter that was written three days after Christopher's birth by Robert, um, lent to us by the University of Edinburgh, and talks about kind of the process of calling up the doctor and on the brand new telephone and how pleased he was to install a, a telephone and uh, this pacing up and down when he waits and waits and waits of for hearing the noise that he knows that we're all will, will be well. Uh, and it's just a lovely kind of moment that he's captured in pen and ink, uh, writing to his best friend who's called Robin Dodds and lived in Australia. So there's a huge wealth of letters there, which has been wonderful to go through, um, especially as, as a family member. Um, so this is the final painting I talked about this evening. Um, and this is the painting which I don't know if any of you were involved, if you were, thank you very, very much. We did a crowdfunding campaign to bring this painting over from Paris. So as I said before, it hasn't been on display for 30 years. And it is part of the Louvre Musée d'Orsay collection. Um, and the reason being is that it was the first painting by a Scottish artist to be bought by the French government. And so that is a huge honor. We're talking kind of 1894, I think, um, of, yes, 1894. And uh, 
that is the time where you know French art and the salon and the government and all of that world of painting in Paris is at its real height um, and so it was a huge honour for this purchase to take place and um, so talking about the people who are in this painting we have at the head of the table John Henry's mother who is sort of hidden slightly behind some of the very elegant lamps. Um, we have Giacco who's being held by Joanna Herbert, who I will come back to shortly. Um, and then in terms of the children round the table, I have their names, but I don't know exactly who is who. Um, but the people who posed for it were Maud, Christian, Reggie, Flo, Patrick, Ruth, Nan, Dolly, Lorna, and Marion. And so they're mentioned in various different family letters. And I think they had a whole load of tea parties and time to model and um, hopefully they were very patient with um, old John Henry who was posing them but if you go and see this and if you or if you zoom in to sort of high res image of this every single child has a different expression which I just think is extraordinary and the way that the light is hitting their face is also just so real and magical. Um, this was inspired by a, a christening for Giacco, who's the baby, um, being held by Joanna Herbert. So Joanna Herbert, I don't have a date for when she was born, but I know that she died in 1916 on the same day as John Henry's mother. And she had been part of the Lorimer family for almost 40 years. So she was employed by Alice um, when she had her first child, Patrick. Uh, she came from British Guyana and had we believe heritage in uh, Sierra Leone uh, as part of the Mende tribe. So her mother was an enslaved person and then slavery was um, abolished when she was around, when Joanna Herbert was around seven. Um, her father was a white man and we don't know anything more than that. So she was an illegitimate child. And what I find really interesting about the way that she's been depicted is that beyond the head tie, which John Henry certainly shouldn't have asked her to wear because it wasn't something that she usually wore and can have quite sensitive connotations um, around slavery. She was represented in a way that she actually lived and worked. And from, I'm no expert on this whatsoever, but from what I've tried to find out, the way that people of color were represented by artists at the time, they were often over-sexualized or objectified or made so dark that their features could no longer be seen. So a very famous painting where that is an example of that is the Manet painting of the prostitute that caused huge scandal. It's quite an art history reference, but um, some of you may, may know it and that there is a, um, a woman of color in the background who is so dark that she, she really can't be seen. And um, from what I can see of letters and descriptions of Joanna Herbert, of which there are many from the many children that she looked after, Joanna, uh, John Henry really worked to, to get her skin tone correct um, and, and represented her in her element, which was looking after these children. And the way that they talked about her is just so beautiful. They continued to correspond with her, even though when she had moved back to Guyana, when all of the children were grown up. And then when they first saw that she was unhappy, they asked if they want, if she wanted to come home. And she said, or I, I've slipped the tongue there, if she wanted to come back to Scotland. And she said, yes, I would love to come back to Scotland. Um, there is a very good boat going in March. And so they paid for her to come back, um, even though she, they, they paid for her to go back to Guyana and then given her a pension. Um, and then she spent the rest of her days in Edinburgh and made jams and jellies from the fruits in the garden and uh, just generally helped out with mending little things that needed mended and being around the house. And so when she died, um, John Henry actually organized her cremation and her funeral. And Alice was seemingly persuaded not to go, I think because of how distraught she was. And, and it just, for me, it just shows how much of a critical part of the family she was. And she, she's represented in four of his paintings. Uh, this is one of them. Lullaby is another of them, and we have a photographic representation of that in the exhibition. The original is in Australia, so that was too far for it to be brought over. 
the other one is Lost, which is called Mushroom Gatherers. And I would love to find that painting one day. It's somewhere in America, I think, in a private collection. And then the fourth is a little sketch, which um, has been kindly lent by a private lender. And that is in the exhibition, along with the rattle that was, that was used by the Chalmers children and which is shown in Lullaby. Um, we have a number of different objects that are shown in the exhibition that are also included in the, the paintings. And we have a talk coming up on that as well from David Jones, which is called The Furniture in the Frames. So on that note, I think I have rattled through um, everything I wanted to tell you all about. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, there we go. And I can finally come and see the chat. Okay. I'm just going to scroll up and see. Okay. See the painting on a bigger screen. Um, I can, I don't know. I think it's a bit difficult. I couldn't really zoom in. Um, Mm -mm -mm. Oh, that's people replying and saying how to do it. Right, does anybody have any, any questions? I'm seeing comments, but please do ask some questions if you have any. You can do this by clicking chat and typing. Okay. Or, or unmuting. Or unmuting if you'd rather. Okay, great. We've got a question um, here. Did John Henry have any special thoughts or attitudes towards the modernist movements in art? Um, not many. So he worked mainly in isolation and he uh, never attached himself to a movement. Um, he never became one of the isms of modern art. Uh, and the, the thing that comes to mind really on that question is uh, that he said that Monet had good qualities of light and air, which is interesting because that's exactly what John Henry himself uh, would have striven, str uh, strove to capture, um, but he had eccentric intentions. So I don't think that he was particularly keen on what these other painters were doing in terms of making their own exhibitions and becoming much less sort of accurate and photographic um, and becoming more painterly. Um, what would be John Henry's favourite portrait? I, that is a great question. Um, I mean, possibly the one of Isabel Scott Elliot um, or Isabel Baxter, um, if he was indeed in love with her, as certain family members have told me. Um, I don't, I haven't ever seen him refer to a portrait as his favourite. There are, there are a number that he felt could have been better. Um, and and so those are more the references that I've seen, but I think Isabel Scott Elliot would be my guess. Um, grandmother's birthday, set in the dining room at Kelly. Yes, correct. And the ceiling is a mixture of the vine and the Earl's room. Uh, I think it's just the vine room. So for anybody who's been to Kelly, it has this beautiful dining room with painted panelling. And uh, the ceiling is the vine room, which was is a huge feature of Kelly, was restored by local um, craftsmen and plasterers. And so John Henry quite frequently did this. He combined the walls or the setting of one part of Kelly and then put a ceiling from somewhere else um, as part of it. And he did that even with the views out of the window. So the Flight of the Swallows is one example of that, where if you go to Kelly, um, you will see where that is set in the window and the mirrors are there, um, but the view out the window is completely different. Um, and if you're interested in that, we have a lecture by Antonia Lawrence Allen coming up where she will talk about um, the way that he combines settings at Kelly and, and where the paintings are set in Kelly. Okay. Um, oh, we've got a, a family member here. We've got a great, great, great grandmother is Alice. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, can people visit Kelly Castle and hear about John Henry's life? Yes, you can. Um, not at the moment. You can go to the garden. Um, the castle itself is closed, but it will reopen uh, around Easter time next year. So just as the exhibition closes, you will then be able to go and see Kelly and hopefully the paintings will be back in situ and you can still see some of those at Kelly. 
Um, was Robert involved in the restoration of Kelly? Not a huge amount. I think he was a pretty much an observer and he just soaked it all up. So as I said, he was 14 um, when the restoration began and it hugely influenced his decision to become an architect, which he announced that he was going to do when he was 14. Um, so I think that he, in terms of Kelly, he designed the, um, the little hut that you can see in the, in the garden. So there's a sort of, um, like a, not a conservatory, but like a little beautiful shed with his very um, distinctive roofs that go like this. Um, and I think he, he helped plan the garden as well. Um, mm -hmm. Why did JH and Robert not have such a good relationship in later life? Good question. And I'm sort of going on instinct on this um, and just sort of trying to read, read the dynamics. But I think that a huge part of it would be that age difference and then the roaring success of Robert. I can't imagine that it was that easy to have a, a brother who was eight years younger and had been knighted twice and was known throughout the UK and just received accolade after accolade. Um, unlike John Henry, who sort of had these near misses in that he was, he was made a Royal Academy, uh, Royal Scottish Academian. I can't ever say that word. He was elected a member of the Royal Scottish Academy, but he wasn't ever elected a member of the Royal Academy in London. And he was offered the Légion d'honneur by the French government following this purchase of grandmother's birthday. But due to a number of pieces of red tape around foreign arts and the British Foreign Office and what their rules were around this, too many years had passed from the purchase of the of grandmother's birthday and then the offering of the Légion d'honneur. And so he was never able to accept it. And I think that would have been a huge blow for John Henry, who was, from what I understand, a very self-facing and very anxious um, artist who didn't ever fully see the value that he actually had in so many of his paintings. Um, one of the, the exhibition let related letters is that his sister Hannah or Laurie had given him or offered him 200 pounds for an exhibition, which was translate today to around 27,000 pounds. And he said that he didn't feel that it was, it felt that it was premature. So he was in his fifties by this point and he'd had a huge number of paintings that had been given medals and, and exhibited at the Royal Academy in London and in Paris. And he still felt that this exhibition would be premature and that it was something that you could only do once, which I think is very telling. So I think that he wasn't as confident possibly as Robert um, and didn't have those external recognizing sort of factors, which um, possibly mattered to him quite a lot. Um, but I think that that could have been a, a, an issue between between them. Um, Anne is asking if I'm also artistic. Um, well, I've been the curating side, so learning about it and writing about it more recently. Um, when I'm not curating this exhibition and doing everything all, all, all to do with the reflections, um, I'm a freelance writer, so uh, that is sort of creative. And um, I studied art at school and um, I thought about going to art college actually, but decided that I wanted to study art rather than, um, than create it. But I may change my mind in future and go back to doing some more practical art. Um, any particular reason for changing the ceilings in the Kelly paintings? Um, no particular reason that I've found. I think just that he, he liked to mix and match and liked to challenge himself and create as beautiful a painting as he could. And those the ceilings that he often chooses are from the Earl's room and from the Vine room. Um, and I think that he just loved to paint them and include them um, and just sort of have a bit of artistic license when it came to those genre paintings. Has anybody else got any other questions? We've hit eight o'clock, um, but I'm aware that I started a little bit late, so I'm happy to keep on taking a few more if you do have them. Hopefully I've answered everything then. Um, do 
do come along to the exhibition if you haven't already been. Um, we'd love to have as many of you there as possible. As I said, it's free and you don't have to book. And as part of that, there is a 12 minute film that you can watch. Um, and the, the script for that film was done by Esther Chalmers. So she was that little girl who's sitting on the knee of Alice um, and has been a huge, hugely important part of my research and um, curating this. And so I edited the script that she wrote and, and we've made it, made it happen, which is um, wonderful. Uh, you can also download the audio guide um, and I can actually put the link here if that would be helpful. Um, let me find it and then we will log off.